Visitors, your honored guests, we would like to welcome you. If you can fill out the uh, blue card in the back of the pew, uh, our members will fill out the white card and we'll pass it in at the appropriate time. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise his give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Let them praises give Jehovah, they were made at his command. Them forever he established his decree shall ever stand from the earth all oh, praise Jehovah all ye flood ye dragons all fire and hail and snow and vapor stormy winds that he Let them praise his give Jehovah, for his name alone is high, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky, all ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and Is great as judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his give Jehovah for his name alone is high. Exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. There was a young sailor who was on a destroyer. It was after the sun had gone down, it was very dark. The winds were very boisterous, the waves were very high. And somehow this young sailor fell overboard into the raging waters. They made every effort they could to try to locate him to bring him back to safety. 
There was another sailor who had gotten sick and they had him in the sick bay and he was close to the area where the young man went into the water. And he heard them yell, man overboard, man overboard. And he was really, really sick and he thought, there's not anything that I can do in this condition. But then there was a lantern and he said, I can at least put it in the window of this little place where I am. And he got up and he made his way over and he puts the lantern there and it just so happened that the lantern was placed in the right place to shine light down on the sailor who was fighting for his life in the water. And they were able to pull him to safety. That seems like a very small thing, but to the sailor who's fighting for his life, it was a very big thing, wasn't it? It may seem like a small thing, and it, and it reminds me of the Christian walk, the Christian life. Every one of us in here has differing talents. And it does not matter if we are the one talent, the five talent, or ten talent. What matters is that we use the abilities that God has given us to bring glory and honor to His name and to reach as many people as we possibly can for the cause of Christ. I've often said throughout my ministry, you give me a congregation full of, of one-talent Christians who are on fire, and I'm going to show you a place we're going to have to be knocking out walls because so many people are going to be here from the work that is being done. Don't think for just a moment that a card in the mail that you send, a phone call that you make, a pat on the back that you give, or encouragement that you say, uh, does not mean something because it does. It's never the big things that mean the most. You know that, and I do too. It's always the little things that mean the most in life. As you therefore have opportunity, the Scripture says there in the book of Galatians, do good unto all men, but then it says what? Especially those who are of the household of faith. I want to challenge us and encourage us to let our light shine in a place, this whole world, that is so dark and filled with sin. Guess what? There are people sitting on the pews with you tonight that are hurting. Oh, they may never say anything to you. You may be one of them. But oh, how we need to be the one who encourages and uses the time and talents that God has given us to make a difference. I want us to think about those of you who need to respond to the invitation tonight. Maybe you think you're a no-talent person. That's not true. You've been created in the image of God, and He has given us all the work to do. If you need to respond to the invitation tonight, everything is ready. Are you ready to respond? We want you to come. If you need to repent of your sins, we're ready to receive you to go to God in prayer for you. For those of you in an audience this size who have never yet rendered obedience to the gospel of Christ, everything is ready. Are you ready to step out in faith, repenting of your sins, confessing his good name, being immersed for the remission of your sins, and then being faithful unto death? Whatever your need, please come. Now, let us stand and sing. Michael, let's sing. Wandering from the fold of God, hear you not the invitation, oh prepare to meet thy God, careless soul, oh heed the warning, for your life will soon be Unprepared to meet thy God. Why so thoughtless are you standing while the fleeting years go by and your life is spent in folly? Oh, prepare to meet thy God.
will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment. Unprepared to meet thy God. If you spurn the invitation till the Spirit shall depart, then you'll see your sad condition unprepared to meet the God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. If you would, please pass your cards to the ends of the aisle so that they can be collected and we'd have a record of your being here. We would certainly appreciate that. As you're doing that, we offer our love and deepest sympathy to uh, Kevin and Nita Austin, Kevin's uh, niece, Tammy Smith, and to all the family in the death of Kevin's great niece, Michaela Coggins, and her unborn baby. In an, they were killed in an automobile accident. Um, that was uh, Tuesday, May the 31st. Uh, so arrangements are incomplete at this time. We love and appreciate y'all. Certainly prayers going up on your behalf. Also, Gary and Anita Lentz and family in the death of her sister, uh, Reba Cothran. Uh, and that uh, graveside service was Saturday the 28th of May in Paragool, Arkansas. Also, we just got word that Walt Metzen is in Jackson Madison County Hospital. He was taken uh, this evening. Uh, still don't know a room number on him yet, but uh, certainly we need to lift him up in prayers. He has pneumonia. Uh, high school, middle school, just want to let you know you're going to be in here to hear Brother Allen hires as well as all of the adult classes are staying in here. And like I said, high school and middle school, you're in here as well. Church events, prime timers, you're reminded of your trip tomorrow to Sykeston, Missouri. The church bus leaves here at the parking lot at 8 o'clock in the morning. If you plan to go and haven't done so, please sign the list in the four-year bulletin board tonight. Also, the adult Bible class that meets in room 101 on Sunday mornings will begin a new class study. Al Earls is going to be doing the teaching, and his topic is Faith in God Reasonable. So please make note of that. Uh, also, students be reminded that uh, the new quarter starts Sunday on June the 5th and Wednesday, June the 8th. Their curriculum is available in the resource room. Teachers, if you have any questions, see James Biggs or Michelle Varell. Also, the blessing bags uh, the, is scheduled uh, to put those together. It's scheduled for Five o'clock this Sunday, June the 5th, in the Fellowship Hall, the blessing bags and all those who are involved. For more information, see Madison de Graves, or you need to see Haley Hansen. All the ladies of the congregation are invited to attend a bridal shower that's honoring Julie Ford, the bride-elect of Zach Stone. This is uh, the granddaughter of Larry and Sandra Curlin. So I want to let you know about that. That's going to be on Sunday afternoon, June the 5th. The shower will be held from 1.30 until 3 in the Fellowship Hall. Julie is registered at uh, thenot.com. Thenot.com. So please uh, make note of that. Michael's going to lead us in another song in just a moment. Right now, Dwayne Waddle is going to lead us in a closing prayer. Dwayne, let us stand. Let us pray. Holy Father, we are so thankful that you've blessed us with another day to come and learn more of your word and sing praises to you. Father, please be with those of this congregation and our loved ones, dear Lord, that are in the hospital and 
those that have lost loved ones, Lord, and comfort them. And we lift them up, dear Lord, to you. Father, be with us in our daily lives for us to be, live a life as an example of how a Christian should live, where they may see you through our actions. Dear Lord, please be with the leaders of our country and others, dear Lord, the world over, and help them, dear Lord, to be able to look to you to live in peace once again. Forgive us when we fail you, Lord, for we are only human, and we fail you every day. In your son's name, Father, we pray. Amen. I'm going rogue on this final song. If you, you're going to need to pull out your songbook because I, I changed it from the uh, sound room, but they can get mad at me about that. So number 642. I think this goes along with what we're, we're about to do. Number 642. And the songbook number 642. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He While our younger classes are going out to their class, I don't want to take up any more of Brother Hire's time than necessary, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, explain to you what we're doing tonight. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to be at the Polishing the Pulpit program, and there was a program called The Greatest Sermons of the Last 200 Years. And I noticed as I was looking through the program that Brother Hires was scheduled to deliver a lecture on that program called The Shepherd's Psalm. So I knew I wanted to be there. And I attended that, and it was frankly one of the finest sermons I've ever heard in my life. And so when I was asked to teach my fellowship hall class on the book of Psalms, I knew right away that I wanted my class to be able to hear this lesson that Brother Hires delivers as he does so fantastically. And I was planning to ask him, and I was having lunch with Jason Jackson one day, and come to find out his class was also studying Psalms. And I said, Jason, I'm going to ask Brother Hires to do the 23rd Psalm for my class. Would you like to join classes for this? And he said, yeah, I'd love to do that. Well, word got around, and one teacher after another said, hey, I want my class to come, too. So as it turns out, everyone who is middle school age and above is going to remain in here, and Brother Hires is going to come and speak to us on the 23rd Psalm. Everything I know about the 23rd Psalm, I learned from Brother G.C. Brewer. I heard Brother Brewer preach the first time when I was about 16 years of age. And I thought I'd never heard a man so speak. I was so moved by Brother Brewer as a preacher. And now, maybe 50 years later, I still feel the same way. Tonight I'm going to deliver a sermon on the 23rd Psalm that I learned 
from Brother Brewer. And I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to try to deliver it as best I can in the way that I remember hearing him. And he began in this manner. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The entire meaning of the 23rd Psalm is found in the first verse. The sheep were entirely dependent upon the shepherd. And you may wonder why in the Word of God, children of God are so often referred to as sheep. They're not referred to as dogs, tigers, lions. And the reason is the dog, the tiger, the lion, almost every other animal you can think of had some means of defense. The sheep had none except the shepherd. The sheep were mild and meek creatures, and they were entirely dependent upon the shepherd for their care. And that is why David begins the 23rd Psalm by saying, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not stand in need of anything because the Lord is my shepherd. Now, the remainder of the psalm is simply an elaboration on that first verse. David says, I shall not want for the good things in life. For the Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me into the green pastures and beside the still waters. That referred to the very best that the sheep could have. And David is using that to express the same idea for those who are the children of God. I shall not want for the very best that life has to offer. Because the Lord is my shepherd and he leads me into the green pastures and by the still waters. One of the darkest lies ever to escape the pits of hell is the idea that we must turn to the devil in order to have a good time. And many of our young people especially have been sold on that idea that they have to get out and sow their wild oats in order to have a good time. But David is saying that is not so. You can have the very best there is in life. You can have the very best that life has to offer if you follow the Lord as your shepherd. I shall not want, even for the best things there are in life, for the Lord is my shepherd. And then I shall not want for the forgiveness of my sins, for he restoreth my soul. Everything that David talks about in the 23rd Psalm, he no doubt had experienced as a shepherd caring for the sheep. And when he says, he restoreth my soul, 
To what does he have reference in the life of the shepherd and the sheep? Well, it so happens that in the evening time, the shepherd would ordinarily lead the sheep back to a sheep fold. That would be a large enclosure, fenced all around it, but no pens or stalls on the inside. There might be half a dozen shepherds come down to the fold at night. And they would simply bring their sheep into the fold, and they would be mingled with all the other uh, sheep folds. And you might wonder, well, how in the world on the next day would you separate those sheep into their various proper places? And the answer to that is found in John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he said, the sheep follow me, for they know my voice. And a stranger they will not follow. And on the morning after the sheep had all been mingled together in that sheepfold for the night, one shepherd might stand over there, another here, another out yonder. They would open the one gate to the sheepfold, and this one would begin to sing a song or to utter a chant or to make a call, and the sheep in his fold would recognize the voice. They would recognize the call, and they would gather together and go in that direction. The shepherd yonder would make a call, and the sheep would go in that direction, and every fold would be filled by the call of the shepherd and the sheep coming to the individual shepherd as the Lord spoke of in the 10th chapter of the book of John. And so the shepherd is out there in the green pastures and the still waters. And when evening begins to gather, and the shadows begin to fall, he's going to make his way from the hillside down in through the valley and to that one fold where all of the sheep will be gathered for the night. That was in order to protect them from the beasts of prey and from uh, wolves and other uh, creatures that might harm them. They're all together in the sheep fold. But the shepherd knew his sheep. And when he gets down to the sheepfold, 98, 99, and one is missing. What does the shepherd do? He turns around and he retraces his steps. And he goes back over the territory that he has covered on the way down from the green pastures and the still waters as he's approaching the sheepfold. And he looks for that one little lamb that is missing. And he calls for it as he goes back over the path. Finally, there distantly, he hears the bleating of that little lamb. And he discovers that it has snagged its leg in a bush or its hoof in a rock. And he reaches down and scoops that lamb up, carries it back to the fold, places it there with the other sheep in that fold. David referred to that experience when he said, He restoreth my soul. The devil tries to make people think that God does not care. That God is not interested in you or in me individually. But the 23rd Psalm belies that. It says that if there's one little lamb, if there is one sheep that is missing, the shepherd is going to turn around, go back on the path where he went, search for that little uh, lamb or that sheep that has gone astray, 
and restore that lamb to the fold. He restoreth my soul. David applies that to the life of the child of God. That when we go astray, when we are in the wrong pathway, God does not write us off. God does not forsake us. But instead, God is anxious for us to be restored to his service. And he awaits us as he did Jerusalem in the long ago. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thee unto me as a hen doth her chicks, but ye would not. The Lord is anxious to restore our souls. So David said, I shall not want for the good things in life. He leads me beside the still waters and into the green pastures. I shall not want for the forgiveness of my sins. He restoreth my soul. And then I shall not want for leadership or guidance. For he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, the uh, shepherd did not drive the sheep. The shepherd led the sheep. Most often he walked out in front of the sheep. And many of the shepherds had a little song they sang, or they might have a little chant that they uttered. And the sheep would hear that and recognize that. And as the shepherd walked along, they would follow after him. But remember that he's going out in search of green pastures and still waters. And sometimes he had to travel over rough terrain. And so you see the shepherd as he puts his foot down and he feels the pathway to make sure that it is solid, to make sure that it is safe for the sheep and the lamb. And that is what David refers to when he says, he leadeth me in paths of righteousness. He knows where we're going. He leads me in a way that is safe and secure. And again, the application he's making there is to the child of God. I shall not want for leadership and guidance, for the Lord leads me through his will, so that wherever I step, if I follow him, it will be safe. And then we come to what I consider one of the most picturesque views of the 23rd Psalm. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And I think about the picture that is drawn from. What David is talking about there first in the actual life of the shepherd and the sheep. He's up on a hillside. That's where the green pastures are. That's where the still waters are located. But now then it's beginning to be dust. Shadows are beginning to fall. Nighttime is approaching. You hear the wild beasts of prey growling out yonder somewhere in the trees. And the little lambs and the sheep are afraid. And they have to travel back down through that valley of shadows. That is what David calls it. The valley of shadows. That's because there are trees there now. 
That's because he has to pass through a shaded area where the sun does not filter through. And he says, Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He is describing that valley of shadows as what it is like to die. And he's saying that when I step down out of the sunlight, when I come down off the hillside, when I walk through that valley of shadows, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. And he says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The staff was a long rod with a crook on the end of it. The rod likely was just a straight shaft. Maybe the rod in the left hand, the staff in the left hand, the rod in the right hand. And now the little sheep steps down out of the sunlight, out of the visible area, out of the rays of the sun, and steps into that valley of shadows. He cannot see very far. He cannot see what is around him. But he can hear the growl of the beast. He can hear the howl of the coyote. He can hear the rustling of the leaves. But he cannot see what is there. And so he wants to turn back, go back up where there's a little sunlight. And he turns to the left. The shepherd reaches out with the staff. He touches the sheep on the left flank. And the sheep feels the reassuring presence of the shepherd. And he hears another sound over yonder. And he turns to the right. And he reaches out now with the rod in his right hand. He touches that sheep on the right flank. And the sheep, once again, is assured the shepherd is there. David refers to that experience when he talks about dying. I remember that uh, Brother Brewer told the story about T.B. Larimore. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the name of Brother Larimore. He was one of the greatest preachers in the brotherhood. Brother Larimore told about when he was a boy. He and his family lived in a little cabin home, school some distance away, a grove of trees between their cabin and the school. And Brother Larimore would walk to school. He'd pass through that grove of trees and on to the school. But in the evening, when he returned home from school, when he would get to that grove of trees, there were shadows all around. It was dark in there. It was hard to see. Brother Larimore went by his initials. T. B. Larimore, and when you know his name, you can understand why he went by his initials. His first name was Theophilus, middle name Brown, Theophilus Brown Larimore, T. B. Larimore. But Brother Larimore said he would come from the school on his way home, and he'd come to the edge of that grove of trees. And when he'd enter into that, it was somewhat frightening. And he would call out, Mother, are you there? And on the other side, just a short way from the cabin where they lived, his mother would be at the edge of that grove of trees, and she would answer, Theophilus, is that you? 
And Brother Larimore said that his mother would come a few steps into the grove of trees and he would walk into that grove from the other side and they would meet somewhere in between and walk out together on the other side. And I remember that Brother Brewer said that Brother Larimore believed that's the way death would be. That we would enter into the shadows of death not knowing what was out there, not understanding what we were going to endure, not being able to see or understand everything about. But he said, the Lord would meet us in the grove of trees, in the valley of shadows. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so the idea was that even when you and I step down from the rays of light, in this life where we live and we step into that valley of shadows called death the Lord is with us as the shepherd was with the sheep thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. The last part of the psalm, I'm not sure what it refers to in the life of the shepherd and the sheep, but I think I know what the meaning of it is. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want for the good things in life, for the forgiveness of sins, for leadership and guidance. And even when I step down into the valley of shadows, called death and here he's saying I shall not want in the presence of my enemies and then finally he ends the psalm by saying surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall not want for what life has to offer because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want no matter what the future may hold. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. No wonder the 23rd Psalm has been one of the favorite passages in the Bible for every generation. It tells us that the Lord is going to take care of us. And as the sheep could not do anything on their own, they relied entirely on the shepherd. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Therefore, I don't have to be afraid of anything. I shall 
not want. Don't you love that psalm? But I would remind us of this, those wonderful, precious, beautiful, reassuring promises are only made to the one who takes the Lord as his shepherd who depends on him, who trusts him, who follows him, who hears his call and responds. And I would say to you and to me, if you want the Lord as your shepherd, if you want to be able to say, I shall not want, for any of these things that are talked about in the 23rd Psalm, then of necessity, we must cast our loyalty with the shepherd. Thank you. Brother David, do we dismiss or what do we do? All right, let's have a word of prayer. Here's Brother Daniel. Come on up here, Daniel. I know Daniel's daddy. Brother Harris, a thousand thanks. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for agreeing to do this. I don't think there's any way we could have heard a better lesson on the 23rd Psalm tonight. Would you bow with me? Our Father, we're so thankful that we can look to you as our shepherd. We pray, Father, that we will trust you as our shepherd, that we will follow your guidance, that we will lean on your goodness, and that we will do that all the days of our lives so that when the time comes for us to pass through that valley of the shadow of death, that we can meet you halfway and go home to be with you forever and to dwell forever in your house. Bless us and keep us as we go forth this week and help us to be faithful sheep in your flock. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're dismissed.